Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to be with you all uh, at this town hall. My name is Matt Castelli, and I'm running for Congress. If those are the only two things you walk away with today, those are probably the two most important things. Uh, what we've been doing is a town hall in at least one in every single county of New York 21. New York 21 now, after redistricting, it used to be 12 counties, it's now 15. It's a big piece of terrain. Uh, makes up about a third of New York State. And so we're getting out and about in the community. We've done so uh, throughout the entirety of this campaign, which today's the one-year anniversary of our campaign. We launched it one year ago today, so I'm really excited to be with you all to help celebrate that. Uh, but what I think I might do is uh, just start off by introducing myself, who I am, a little bit of my background, why we're running, and then uh, we can get into some questions. We'll open it up. I'll probably preserve about 10 or so minutes at the very end. Uh, to let you all have an opportunity, if you don't feel comfortable asking a question or, or standing up and, and expressing an issue uh, in front of everybody, we can do it one on one to make sure you have that opportunity as well. So, my name is Matt Castelli, running for Congress. I was born and raised uh, down a little bit further south than the southern portion of the district in the Hudson Valley. Uh, and the last name Castelli means castle in Italian. So, protecting others and providing a sense of safety, security, and strength is really a part of who I am, part of my DNA. But part of my upbringing that I think is particularly relevant for my approach to things is I came from a bipartisan household. My dad's the Democrat, mom's the Republican. They still both are. But we didn't deal with politics growing up because many years ago it didn't involve itself in everything the way it does right now. We talked about shared values. That's what united us. That's what we focused on. And so I went to college in Siena, not too far away. And about 21 years ago, uh, this week, 9-11 happened. I was in college, and that became a driving force for my career. I went and served my country at the CIA, served there for nearly 15 years, doing counterterrorism work. I led teams hunting down some of the world's most dangerous terrorists. I worked in the same department that found Osama bin Laden, found, most recently, Ayman al-Zawahiri, who was the leader of Al-Qaeda. Those were my friends that helped find that individual. I did comparable manhunting efforts in, in that regard, served in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, and had enough success doing all of that and I was tapped by the Obama White House to come down and serve as the Director for Counterterrorism at the National Security Council. A role I was asked by the Trump administration to stay on it, and I did, for the first year of the Trump White House. Because if I learned anything throughout my career of public service, it's this. When it comes to protecting our country, our communities, my family, yours, it requires us to put country before party. And my belief in that has never been. When I returned back to CIA after that tour, I did some work with cutting edge technology startups, got a business degree out in Northwestern, and then COVID hit in 2020. It marked another watershed moment because the area that I grew up in, that's where you can find West Point. My grandfather was an army doctor at West Point. Got out of the army, remained a physician, raised a family of nurses. Almost every one of my family is a nurse, with the exception of my mother, she served in a different way, she became a teacher. But my grandpa instilled this sense of duty within all of us, a duty to care for others. And so when COVID hit, we got to this point pretty quickly in the pandemic where we were having a 9-11 every single day in this country in terms of deaths. I decided, decided this was the most compelling challenge of our time. So I left government after nearly 15 years and joined a healthcare organization here in New York, started by veterans to better coordinate care for veterans, rural communities, by connecting health and social care together a real focus on our human and social service providers in the community, mental health resources, housing resources, to make sure that we actually can improve the overall health and well-being of folks within our communities. I was building out coordinated care networks throughout the Northeast. Loved what I was doing, it was quite transformational. And then January 6th happened. If you might imagine, former counterterrorism guy who spent a career trying to prevent things like that from happening in foreign capitals, to see it happen in our own didn't sit well with me but certainly then to the response that we saw from Congresswoman Stefani. I believe she turned her back on her democracy. I think she violated her oath to the Constitution, the same oath that I took. Uh, and that's something when we talk about uh, protecting the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, I think she really violated that and continues to do so. And at the end of the day, what we saw her do in that day and subsequently was to sell out our country, to sell out our national security in order to advance her own political interests. And we've certainly seen that here in our district, right? It's not just at the national level imperiling our country, it's in our community, where her own personal advancement has come at the expense of our community. And, and certain areas within our community, whether it's veterans or women or seniors, 
She certainly voted against our interests time and time again and sold us out. And so what I believe is that we need a representative who is going to put country before party, who's going to put our interests first, who's going to make investments in our future, not their future. And that's what our campaign is really all about. Now, what I'd love to do is open up the floor. You know, as we talk about things here today, I just want to note, I am not currently a federal legislator. So here in this town hall, I can't point you to uh, legislation that I have passed or I've worked on or whatever it may be. Uh, there may be some things that you raise that I don't have an answer for, but my commitment to you is that I'll say that and I'll go work to figure out what the right answer might be. Uh, but here, what I'd love to do is have a conversation. Uh, whatever your political affiliation or background, everybody should have a, an opportunity to express a viewpoint, ask a question, and we'll offer the best response that we have to be able to actually address the common challenges that are facing all of us. Because my belief is that the challenges that are facing our communities don't care whether we're Republicans or Democrats. They care about whether we're actually coming together and actually solving. So I'll pause there. And Meryl, I like that your hand is up first. <laughs> um, I was actually asked by someone from the other side to ask you this question. Great. Uh, and, and it's a tough one, so I'm going to start with a tough one for Great. you. Um, you have proven in everything that you've said since you started your campaign that you are a moderate Democrat. Um, your motto is country over party. You, if you win this election, you're going to go down and work in the House of Representatives that a lot of people have found out that if you don't swing all the way to the edges, you're not going to get any help and you're not going to get any committee assignments and you're going to, how are you going to combat that? Well, I think that you hit the nail on the head. And I think that orientation, that expectation of our elected officials is exactly what's wrong with America. Mm -hmm. It's what's wrong with what we see with Congresswoman Stefanik right now, as well as members of the other side, Democrats as well. When you put party loyalty first rather than the individuals you were elected to represent, you start moving towards those extremes. And right now, one of the big concerns that I have is that the loudest voices in the room that are dominating our political discourse, that are dominating the conversation in Washington, are those on the extremes. Yeah. The great middle majority, the great moderate majority that many of us find ourselves in, we don't have a voice in. And so our campaign, but also my desire to be an elected representative, is to restore a voice for that great moderate majority. And I think that requires calling folks out on both sides of the aisle, regardless of what your political affiliation is. Because my job that I'm applying for, from all of you, is to be your representative. Not to represent a political party, not to represent a president, but to represent New York 21. That is the job that I should care most about, that's the job that I should be evaluated on every single two years. Not how good a Democrat I am, not how good a Republican someone may be, not how good I am at fighting with the other side. Because when we're consistently fighting with one another, we're never in a position to fight for one another. Yeah. And so that's what we need a restoration back to. That's my diagnosis of the problem with Washington right now and what the issues we have, and I'm gonna fight against it every single turn. I actually have two questions. First of all, the, the Democratic Party is meeting right now, and there's a resolution in front of them to ban corporate donations to candidates. I just want to know your thoughts on that. And second of all, if you are elected, what are you going to do to get the Amtrak train running back up to Plattsburgh and Ross Point? Yeah. Um, so the first question is about corporate money in politics, because this is another, I think, big problem. Now, I took pledge early on in this campaign to swear off any corporate PAC donations to our campaign. So I personally, this campaign, what we're, what we're running, you won't find any contributions from corporate entities. Because at the end of the day, we find politicians who are, at times, more interested in their re-election prospects. And in order to get re-elected, they need to keep those campaign coffers going. And in order to do that, they find themselves beholden to corporate interests, not our constituents' yes. interests. And so that is a key problem with our electorate, that, or with our election system. And it's something that I would consistently fight against. Uh, so I'm glad to see some members of a political party continuing to champion that work because there's a lot of work that needs to be done to take that corporate influence out of politics, that dark money that really underscores everything and creates scenarios where you have politicians who are selling out to those corporate interests rather than addressing our needs. We certainly see that with Congresswoman Stefanik because she's got campaign coffers that are wide open to uh, big oil, big pharma, any number of corporate entities who she cares more about in order to advancing her own prospects than addressing our interests and concerns. The other uh, question that was asked about the infrastructure and opening up uh, the uh, Amtrak rail to get as far north, I think we should. We need to be connecting our communities. 
and whether it's through federal rail, like uh, an Amtrak entity or something else, we need to open up those pathways and to be a strong voice to making sure that we're allowing transit through our communities, that we're in a position to actually open up those pathways. If there are requirements for investment that need to be made, advocacy, I would be a strong voice to making sure we're in a position to do so. Um, perhaps your uh, medical experience could help in this. Um, the uh, regional hospital in Malone yeah. uh, was purchased uh, by UDM and has been turned into a feeder institution. Uh, and uh, uh, significant uh, services have been eliminated and obviously more are going to be eliminated. So uh, I'm wondering if you have any ideas on how we might approach that. Yeah. But well, certainly something that I've heard from this community, certainly in Franklin County, specifically in Malone, uh, because we, we hit the nail on the head. A lot of services are now being cut by an entity that exists outside of this state that's controlling healthcare services that are available in our community. We don't have availability for, let's say, maternity health. I was chatting with a woman in Malone a couple of months ago who is right now with child and has to drive an hour to get the kind of medical services that you need. That's unacceptable. We need to be able to provide certainly critical healthcare services within our community, but I would expand that aperture to human and social services. I think from a federal legislation perspective, there's an opportunity where one, we can draw awareness and attention that I believe for communities to be in a position to thrive, we need to have critical services made available. Does it have to be in a big hospital system? Maybe not. Maybe some of those things can be done on a clinic by clinic basis, but we need to have an assessment of what critical resources should be available within proximity to a population center. I think that there is actually a little bit of arm twisting that can happen too because many of those entities require Medicare or Medicaid reimbursement. So the federal government has uh, an opportunity to say, if you're not gonna offer certain services in certain communities, you may not get the kind of reimbursement uh, that you were expecting in order to provide and keep operations going in that environment. And so I think that there is some influence that could be exerted. I would like to see also from New York State's perspective, and this is an opportunity again, where you wish you had a stronger voice representing our area that could influence legislators in Albany or the governor to say, hey, listen, a Vermont-based health system that's operating in our area needs to make these kinds of uh, minimum requirements, meet these minimum requirements in terms of the services that are provided, because that's not what we have right now. So it's, it's gotta be a multi-pronged approach between our local community, the state, and the federal government, but it's certainly unacceptable with what folks are facing right now. I have more if nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, so recently the government passed the Inf Inflation Reduction Act. Yep. And um, with some investments for renewable energy and things like that and some helpful, helpful things for lowering drug prices and stuff like that. Yep. But politically, there's rumors of some side deal between Joe Manchin and the leadership that says, we're also gonna pass this change to permitting, permitting um, for oil and gas infrastructure to make it easier, kind of take away local objections to this stuff. And I'm just wondering what your approach to those kind of side deals and that specific one, if you support that or not. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm aware of what the side deal may be and the specifics of that. But one thing that I can say in talking about this Inflation Reduction Act, which at the end of the day was a bill about health care, reducing prescription drug prices for our seniors, allowing actual negotiation between Medicare and pharmaceutical industry to reduce those costs, capping the costs for our seniors, and a lot of investment in combating climate change. But in that regard, and I think that this is sort of the important point, this is such a significant opportunity for us in our region not just to create new economic opportunities, but to create some protections for the environment that we all love and enjoy, certainly throughout much of the park, uh, and, and recognizing that those two things are tied, our local economy and our environment. So we have to be making investments in that regard. Now, there is a compelling challenge that we are all facing right now um, about gas prices, right, and fossil fuels. I was pleasantly surprised to be uh, driving through Chateauguay in the sea uh, the gas prices here, I'm certainly filling up here before I, <laughs> uh, things are going, uh, they're all right, they're, they're on the right trajectory, but that's not something we can take for granted. Uh, the best way to address this problem that we are all facing that impacts everything, we talked about goods and services, they're all impacted by this rise in prices, is competition in the market. 
capitalism. I also, you know, I went to business school, so I'll take the former CIA hat off on, and I'll put the business school hat on. For capitalism to work, for the consumer to benefit, there has to be competition in the market. Two competitors competing for your business reduce prices. Right now, if we're so reliant on fossil fuels, there's no competition here. That price is set on a global basis, and we don't have as much say in that market. So from an energy perspective, we benefit from having choice. We benefit from having diversification. We benefit from making investments in alternative energy sources. I'm not saying doing away with fossil fuels. We're going to have to have that as a part of the suite of services. But the investments that are long overdue to prevent the scenario that we're now in, which is being so beholden to the fossil fuel industry and those wild swings that may happen with a global commodity, you know, whether it's an international conflict in Ukraine, whether it's the COVID pandemic, those are things that have big impacts on the, the price of oil and the price of the gas pump. And we are so subject to those swings because we don't have alternatives. And we need to actually break ourselves away from that dependency and those swings that we're gonna face. So whatever's happening in backroom deals, I would hope that any legislator is operating with that in mind, that we need to make sure that we're looking out for the best interests of the people we were elected to represent and making the kinds of long-term investments, not just focused on the short term. I'd like to kind of tag on, I think what, what you were perhaps uh, uh, getting at was uh, essentially a continuation of the weakening of home rule mm -hmm. and the inability of especially rural areas uh, that have been the site of extractive industries uh, that support urban uh, and this area certainly uh, uh, has experienced that for a couple of centuries, and in fact, the creation of the Adirondack Park came from the over-extraction of industries. And uh, let's face it, Democrats have a history of liking centralized control, which is uh, uh, kind of contradictory with home rule. So I'd love to have your thoughts on how much control a community should have over what kind of extractive industries uh, are, are placed in their community? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's one in which is really relevant right now, even with the discussion about alternative energy sources. Because as we, throughout much of this district, 15 counties that make up much of Northern New York, we can and should take advantage of the opportunity to be the alternative energy source for New York State, the, the Northeast, whatever it may be. Because we've got wide open spaces, We've got a lot of sunlight, we've got hydro waves, we can actually generate a lot of energy. But we should be benefiting more from that than, let's say, the energy users in, let's say, downstate or New York City. If we're the ones who are doing the hard work, if we're the ones who are extracting those resources, we should have a disproportionate advantage over other areas in, in, the, in, the, in the Northeast, in, the, in New York State, whatever it may be. And I think you also hit the nail on the head in terms of home rule. And I'll push back a little bit because we've certainly seen across both sides of the aisle some folks violating that principle of local control over things. And I'll, I'll highlight, unfortunately, Congresswoman Stefanik, who claims to be a conservative, but on the issue of education in particular, she has decided to use her federal power to insert herself into local uh, schools, local school administrators, to creating divisions between parents and teachers, threatening in places like Fulton County federal subpoenas of local school boards, that runs at complete odds of the concept of local control, local home rule over what's going on within a school district. And so I think you're right in terms of getting back to those first principles of allowing for strong local government, making determinations for what's best for that local area. But as many of these challenges that we face, whether it's economics, growing our economy, uh, extracting resources, creating energy, creating opportunities, there has to be some degree of collaboration. Collaboration between the local environment, the state, and the federal government. And right now, we see, I think, a little too much division between those entities to actually benefit all of us in our local community. I'll follow up sure. and say that um, in the past, there, some of the extractive industries have uh, directly benefited uh, the region through jobs. I'll point to the Moses Saunders Power Dam and Messina and the aluminum plants uh, that get uh, reduced costs 
power and employ a lot of people in the past more than now. But many of the, of the extractive industries, hydroelectric dams, the renewable energy uh, installations we're seeing now that uh, once they're installed, the power is exported. There are very few jobs left behind. That power is not used to generate jobs in the community. Yep. How would you approach uh, making, if, if, if we're not going to put solar arrays on top of the abandoned uh, shopping malls in yeah. Passaic? Yep. Uh, uh, or the parking lot. Or the parking lots. Uh, yeah. Why? Why do we get to host uh, all of that infrastructure right. without any but, but have any benefit left behind? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And we I, should. I, I would say something. I'd rather work for a New York power authority than, you know, like when some people don't have power. We have power because of our local um, power generation. We do. We do have that. And you know, um, obviously, the same. So you do have power when other people have power after you have that. But I, th I think you make a good point in terms of if the investment is being made in our community, if our labor is going towards creating that, while yes, we're happy to be a part of a larger solution that benefits others, we should probably get a little bit of outsized benefit than others, right? If we're creating a green energy engine for the state of New York, leveraging our natural resources, we should benefit from that with reduced energy costs, more so than, let's say, downstate. Maybe we get a better price on that. And that's something that I would strongly advocate for. Just for your, for your information, those uh, books and maps on either side of you, this 100 megawatt project is coming into the town of Shattagag and Burke, and there's more downstairs. So uh, that's what goes into plus years of uh, negotiation with yep. the towns. So we're doing it. So a lot of the companies that are building these arrays, that are building the wind towers and all of that stuff, all the all the renewable energy, they're getting federal money to do so. Is there a way to somehow insert a better uh, helping the, the local economy better than what is done now? In the like in when they receive that money, you know? yeah. in order to receive this money, this 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 needs to be done. They right. already do. They pay a most community agreement, plus a pilot agreement until they want full tax They said, this town hall is basically a result of the wind turbine money. And uh, our highway system, our highway equipment and everything is based on the wind turbine money. Yeah. But, I think but we're asking you questions. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. I, 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 I love the trust of it. Like, you cannot, I, full disclosure, I recently, recently moved from Connecticut. Okay. And Connecticut has done things like say, you have to have 60% union employees right. and you have to first try to hire local people and, and that, that has to be the first priority before you. And that's in the contract for these, for these developments. But and certainly from a federal perspective, you have the opportunity and should be it's with respect to any you know, project labor agreements that you're going to have prevailing wages that are built into a requirement for uh, any type of local infrastructure that's leveraging federal dollars in your local community, tapping into and creating union labor that's going to be participating in that. And this is an opportunity, I think, too. We need to keep building our, our union and our labor force. I think we represent throughout much of the North Country a strong, proud union tradition. And maybe over the past couple of decades it's ha it has waned, but I'm starting, I'm starting to see it come back. And we need to be educating and uh, providing a degree of support that this is a lifeblood for many of our communities. Uh, an opportunity to create a workforce that has good paying jobs, solid benefits, can keep our communities together. Because I, I see a lot of folks in here, how many have faced an, an issue where either you couldn't find a job opportunity and felt either a temptation to relocate it out of the area, or maybe your kids. And we now have the prospect of kids leaving the area. Those kids may go on to have grandkids for you. And now our, our families are taken apart because the job opportunity wasn't here. So these are the kinds of investments we can be making in our community to create a position for them to be thriving. And right now, we don't have a federal legislator, and Elise Stefanik, who's advocating for investments in our community. She hasn't in eight years. I wanna make sure that people are aware of something. Congresswoman Stefanik has passed two pieces of legislation throughout her eight years in Congress, despite paying her well over a million dollars. 
a um, commemorative coin and the renaming of a post office are bills that she sponsored that got passed into law. That is it. So when she talks about her record of results, it's oftentimes federal dollars that are coming despite her voting against it. Yes. It's coming yes. despite her not working on those projects. She certainly didn't sponsor them. She's claiming credit for other people's work. Right. Some of this effort in this campaign is a little bit of education because we need to have somebody that's focused on our future, making the kinds of investments in our community. And right now, she's sold out our future in order to advance her future because voting against those things helps her career as it certainly has boosted her in the ranks within her party. Will you, will you be debating her? <laughs> <laughs> That's an open, it's an open question right now. We've, we've agreed to the debates that have been offered to us, at least three, we're open to as many. She hasn't agreed to any of them yet. Uh, and we're putting pressure on her to say, yes, let's have these debates because the people she, that elected her deserve to have an opportunity to ask her hard questions, whether it's through a debate moderator. She's certainly not availing herself to constituents in a town hall format like this. She doesn't make herself available to our local press outlets to ask hard questions. Um, and we certainly want to have the opportunity in a debate format to do so. So keep putting pressure uh, and calling for that. We certainly will continue to do so. It's usually a secret when she uh, is coming up here anyway, unless you're in her circle. It's a big yeah. secret every time she comes yeah. up here. I just have that debate with somebody. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a concern I've heard from others, is that she's not a representative for everyone. She's just a representative for, for a certain select few. Uh, I heard she breezed into Malone maybe a couple of weeks ago and we spent uh, some time with some ardent supporters. But when there were desire to have her come up and participate in things like Adirondack Beck Fest or whatever it may be, she wasn't anywhere to be found. And so we need a representative for everyone. And that's my pledge and commitment to be a representative for everyone. Well, one of the issues that we ran into not long ago, actually spring of 2017, was there was an ice backup on the Salmon River in Malo. It came within inches of letting out the wastewater treatment plant and that would have contributed at least five to seven million gallons of untreated sewage into the Salmon River that would then flow through the northern part of our county into uh, Canada and ultimately through a wildlife sanctuary and into the Salmon River. Uh, one of the issues that we had was talking to the Army Corps of Engineers, and they of course said, well, it'll take us about seven or eight years where the paperwork gets to our desk. Right. In contacting our esteemed congresswoman, Ron, she said, oh yeah, I'll get right on that. After about two years of me following up on that, the standard response was, oh yeah, we're working on that. And that's about as far as it went. Now, obviously, a bureaucracy like the Army Corps of Engineers is has a significant amount of inertia. <laughs> but They're not the only bureaucracy that is. <laughs> As a longtime federal employee, I can speak to that authoritatively. But the challenge is that in the meantime, in the, in the five years since then, the risk for that has only accumulated. Right. And so is there a way, with your experience, you can occasionally prod some of the um, folks into actually being preemptive instead of saying, oh, geez, that's really a bad thing that happened to you guys, so sorry. Right. I mean, this is uh, an approach, unfortunately, by the federal government on a myriad of issues. And it's this concept of why do we always wait until calamity strikes before we take action? We can see it coming a mile away. And if we just made the smaller investment early on preemptively, we could avoid disaster. But then when disaster strikes, it costs X number of you know uh, dollars more, whatever it may be. Unfortunately, the polarization, I believe, in Washington doesn't create a space for people to come together, recognize common problems, make the investments to avoid them. Because the political will comes when there is disaster. That's when they recognize, oh, there's an expectation for us to actually do something and get something done. Um, but some of that is fostered by this extremism and this divisiveness because we're not holding 
our representatives accountable for producing the results that we expect. We're voting them into office based upon how good a Democrat or how good a Republican they are, oftentimes that's through the lens of how well they fight with the other side. And unfortunately, we are all left less uh, fortunate because of that position. My perspective would be to take that to the highest levels of, of government and to make sure we resolve that. Certainly through you know, the federal bipartisan infrastructure dollars that sound perfect for that. A bipartisan infrastructure bill that Congressman Stavati voted against. Yeah. You want to know who else voted against it here in New York State? It wasn't Lee Zeldin. He voted for it, right? So she's way out of step with her party. Mm -hmm. Alexandria Ocasio, o or, or AOC, voted yeah. against it. <laughs> so there's a lot of commonality between the extremes here in not actually voting for the kinds of things that can benefit our community in New York State. Uh, speaking about the extremes, uh, I work for the New York State Department of Corrections. Uh, your district has a large population of correctional officers. Uh, you also have a large contingent of hunters. Yeah. And uh, one thing we have seen ourselves in, in past races here in the 21st is that guns can be a very hot button topic. When I posted to my Facebook recently, which I put myself out there quite a bit, I kind of yeah. feel like an island with my but um, based on what they've been told by the right wing news outlets, yep. you are anti gun, you are anti Second Amendment, you are anti Constitution. What do you say to those people? Well, we're going to push back on that in every single turn. And thanks for the opportunity. I am a very strong supporter of the Second Amendment. I swore an oath to the Constitution. The Second Amendment's the second piece of that Constitution, right? I'm always going to protect the rights of our lawful gun owners. I'm someone who carried firearms throughout the line of duty in places like Afghanistan and Iran. This is something that is an important piece of our tradition, our history, and we actually established, I think, a great model for the rest of the country about safe, responsible gun ownership. We shouldn't, however, allow ourselves to, because I think some of this gets fed by some of the things that are happening within this state. And here I, I'm going to call out my own party. Uh, I don't like some of the things that we've just seen from the state government in terms of uh, gun restrictions. I think when you're dealing with a constitutional right, you can't be hasty with that. And I think some of these laws that were just passed were too hasty. I think they were, had outsized influence from downstate uh, legislators, and they didn't take into consideration the rights and expectations of upstate gun owners, law-abiding gun owners. And a case in point is this confusion about the park and whether people who live in the park and travel through the park, you know, what rules apply to them. And so that's just a good example of why that should have been addressed by having smart, thoughtful discussion and debate uh, inserted into that legislation to avoid any kind of confusion. Because we want to respect the rights of law-abiding gun owners. That's a position I've had, not just from the start of this campaign, that's who I am, it's the oath that I swore to protect, and it's an oath that I will maintain throughout my life. What, what sort of common sense uh, things would you like to see be done though? Yeah, I mean, I think the recognition has to be made that we're in this really unique moment. We have these events like what happened in Buffalo. We have these events down in terrible school shootings in Valde. Now, gun violence is the number one killer of our kids. So there is a moment of urgency about addressing that. And I think the best way to address that, and this is what we see from law-abiding gun owners, those of us who support the Second Amendment, is by making sure we have common sense universal background checks, solutions like that, to keep firearms out of the hands of someone that's gonna do themselves and others harm. Common sense. This is what our police and our law enforcement expect, because right now they're on the front lines battling this rising gun violence in our communities. I wanna keep those firearms out of the hands of cop killers and kid killers. And right now, on the other side of the, the pendulum, you have someone like Congresswoman Stefanik, whose husband happens to work for the gun law. Yeah, yeah. And they're working in overtime to make sure that every cop killer, every uh, terrorist, every domestic abuser, every somebody you know, that's gonna you know, cause harm in our schools, that they have unfettered access to any firearm that they want. I think that that's wrong. I think we need to respect the rights of law-abiding gun owners, respect and protect the Second Amendment, but also use common sense to unify our community, to keep our communities, our kids, our cops safe. And one last piece from corrections, sorry. Yeah. Um, one of the big things right now that we're facing in corrections in New York State, is the HALT yeah. Act. Uh, what they've done for those who aren't in, in the corrections is they've made it so that 
if a uh, no, almost no matter what a incarcerated individual does, he will not serve more than 15 days in a special housing unit. Um, that has taken uh, basically the inmates have taken that as carte blanche that we can do whatever we want. Um, it's led to the largest number of assaults on staff that we've ever seen in New York State, and it just rises every single day. And I, I unfortunately saw one of the worst ones at Upstate recently. Um, what, do you, what do you say that uh, our own party we passed that? Yeah. And we might have gone too far to one side. Yeah. And you and I have talked about this. I've talked about it with other corrections. And thank you for your service to our community, because that's the first place we need to be operating from. Our corrections are public servants. They serve our community by keeping us safe. They serve our community by making sure that we're rehabilitating inmates, that when they return to civilian population, that they're good, upstanding citizens. So we need to empower and provide the kind of trust and resources that our corrections need. As I understand, conversations you and I have had, tremendously under-resourced right now in terms of staffing. And so when you lay on top, from what I've heard, now again, this is a state issue, it's not necessarily a federal issue, but I'm concerned about our community and the impact here. That when you impose restrictions that sort of tie the hand behind the back in an under-resourced environment, you create rising threat to our corrections officers, and you don't actually get the kind of rehabilitation you need out of those inmates. And so again, here's an example where I don't think we had as much upstate voice influencing downstate-driven legislation. And as someone who used to also be a public employee at the federal level, I don't really love it when legislators come in and tell me how to do my job you know, to achieve my mission. I did so in the counterterrorism world, and I don't necessarily like it when they're telling us how to do our job the best way. Our corrections officers know how to do the job, and we need to empower them with the kind of trust and resources they need to get the job done. With these common sense guidelines that you're using yeah. where you're talking about, how do you feel about assault rifles? So I think assault rifles and assault weapons is oftentimes a misnomer, because that term of art means different things to different people. Right. And when we start focusing on that, we run the risk of breaking apart the kind of coalition we need to keep our community safe. And so when you start talking about, and I had a, a, an opponent in the primary who was very big on an assault weapons ban. I do not share that. I'm opposed to an assault weapons ban because I don't I believe it achieves the objective of keeping our community safe. Right now, I believe that the best way to keep our communities, our kids, or cops safe is by not focusing on one type or style of weapon. It's about any weapon being kept out of the hands of those who are gonna do it themselves and others harm. And when we keep the focus on that, universal background checks, common sense solutions along those lines, we can actually achieve the objective. But when people, like I had in my primary, were advocating for an assault weapons ban, triggers go off. And the key members of the coalition that we need of law-abiding gun owners, they start viewing that as a wedge, pushing folks away, and we lose the opportunity to actually keep our community safe. So I don't support an assault weapons ban. Um, I, I like hearing your uh, common sense solutions for uh, gun violence. I think it's very important. Um, uh, I have to say that uh, I see no reason uh, that a civilian weapon should ever have more than three rounds. And that includes pistols, assault rifles, everything. Three round limit. Uh, you can avoid a lot of the uh, grotesque massacres that have been occurring lately. You can still kill several people, but you don't get to kill 20 or 30. So, and anyway, and then people can have their weapons, but you know, guns don't kill people, bullets do. So limit the bullets. Completely on a different direction. Sure. Farmers across the country, including New York State, are having program works, but it's very restrictive. It's restrictive on the farms, it's restrictive on the workers that come from offshore. Yep. Uh, there's been a push and an advocacy for a guest worker program, which would uh, allow those people to come in without fear of dumping the border or whatever the term is, uh, and having a, a legal right to come here and work and then go home with their, their profits. That's why they're here. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah. So the question for folks who didn't hear it is about 
certainly the impact to our agricultural industry of worker shortages and the opportunity from an immigration perspective to have uh, uh, guest worker programs, the H-2A visa, and it's been currently restricted. How do we open it up? How do we create opportunities? I would fully support that because this is something I hear from farmers all across our district. Shortage of workers. Now, it's not just our agricultural industry, we're short of workers everywhere. The best way to grow our economy, to keep it on a path to growth, and certainly our agricultural industry, is to make sure that we have are addressing these worker shortages. And comprehensive immigration reform, H-2A visas, is a good way to go down that path. I think one of the challenges we've had in addressing common sense solutions for making sure that there is a pathway for immigration or for guest workers is the question around security over our border. I'm not gonna sacrifice or cede any territory to anybody about our national security. I'm a longtime national security professional. I believe in border security. And I believe that over the last couple of decades, Politicians on both sides of the aisle have used these issues for their political benefit to get reelected and haven't actually answered the question. Our border is not fully secure right now, and I don't trust leaders of either political party to actually get the job done or to tell us that it's done. They use it as a political weapon. So I believe we need to make the investments that are necessary to actually secure the border, because this is another challenge in terms of an under-resourced uh, industry and uh, workers that we have on our northern border, because our border patrol agents are getting constantly deployed down there. They're constantly under strain. The best way to achieve both of these objectives is to secure the damn border, and that's something that I would fight for. I don't trust folks like Congresswoman Stefanik, who's been in office for eight years, during a period of time in which her party's president was leader. They didn't secure the border. They use it as a political weapon. I'm not sure this should necessarily even be left up to the politicians in Washington. I think right now the American people have a deficit of trust there's a possibility, I think, one of the ideas that we've been talking about is set, establishing a bipartisan, independent kind of commission yeah. to actually evaluate what is the true nature of the security of our border, where are there gaps, and where should we fill those gaps? How can we take an area that we can restore trust on behalf of the American people about keeping our nation safe, and then secure the border once and for all, and then create a secure, honest, legitimate pathway to help grow our economy? I live on the Jameson Line Road, and a few years ago they closed that border, and there's no gate across, and anybody can drive back and forth across the border. They should open it back up again. I don't know, it's not a question, but <laughs> well, this, is a, this is an opportunity to have an open discourse, to share yeah. input, because that's that's what a healthy democracy requires, and I, I think that, you know. Yeah, the Jameson Line should be opened back up again. Okay. As a custom to let people check in and out yep. instead of just driving back and forth across. There is scientists telling them to go to the nearest border, please. <laughs> 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 That's a bunch of bullshit. It creates a it creates a vulnerability, right? That's right. Because the honor system is not something. I'm a former counterterrorism official. I don't want to operate on the honor system to make sure that terrorists aren't coming in from the northern or southern border. We need to make sure that we have the resources available to protect our nation. That's right. And we can do so in such a way that then creates a clear pathway to actually address the worker shortages that we're having. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having this meeting. I'm sure you're aware that many of us are here is to come up with five reasons other than, uh, to vote for Matt Castelli other than Elise Stefanik, because folks are desiring a change. Uh, now, one of those reasons is there's just, just two of us, so uh, that is the option here, but I'll, 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 I'm just kidding aside. I was but, told to vote for you by my daughter and a friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's who I voted for. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate your support in this campaign. And my Listen, husband, too, voted for you. Yeah. I think the first thing, and this is maybe top of order, is that I'm someone who spent my entire life serving my country and my community, whereas Congresswoman Stefanik has served only herself and the loyalty to her own party. When we look about the record of results, Congresswoman Stefanik, as we just noted, she doesn't have a record to run on. She runs on dividing our community, and it undermines the ability to actually solve the problems that we have in front of us. 
She does so because she seeks to advance her own career. She does so because she wants to ascend a political ladder. She's done very well for herself in that regard. And if folks want to use their vote to help advance her career, that's fine. That's their constitutional right. That's what democracy is all about. But I think we should be making our vote based upon our future. And my commitment is that I will always be more interested in your future than my own. So the first is that I've always served my country and my community. She served herself and her uh, party loyalty. Her record, second thing, is one in which she has not produced the results that we need. I'm someone who you can trust to make sure is always gonna be looking out for our safety, our security, and our strength, because that's what I've done throughout my entire career. I think the third thing is that I'm not gonna be beholden, we asked this question earlier, to what the party forces say. I don't care about being a politician. I'm not doing this because I've had some sort of long-held aspirations to you know, get into politics and ascend the political life. I left government after 15 years and uh, transitioned to the private sector. I was quite successful. I got a business degree. I could be doing other things. I'm doing it out of a sense of duty. And my duty is to restore a sense of public service to our community. We need that. And we need to, I think, set an example for the rest of the country, pushing back against these forces of extremism. That's maybe the fourth thing, is to talk about the, the threat that we now face. Because Congresswoman Stefanik, in recent years in particular, she certainly changed. And right now, her actions are to uh, sell out our veterans. She's voted against veterans' health benefits, like this burn pit legislation, yeah. to provide health care resources to individuals that I served with in places like Afghanistan and Iraq that had toxic burn pit exposure. She voted against that. She sold out our veterans. She sold out women by voting against guaranteeing reproductive rights and voting against access to contraception. She sold out our seniors by voting against opportunities to reduce the cost of prescription drugs, things that we've been challenged to address for decades, common sense solutions to allow for negotiation. So I'm always gonna focus on making sure that our community, our constituents, have someone who's gonna have their backs, not sell them out to advance their interests. Uh, and then the fifth thing is I think you're always gonna have access to me. Whether it's at a town hall environment, whether it's through social media, whether it's through members of the press, she's someone that I think hides behind the walls of Washington. She certainly spends more time in Mar-a-Lago than she does in Messina or Milan. Um, and I'm always gonna be here in the community. I'm always gonna be available to you because that's the job, is to show up and to hear your concerns, regardless of party, regardless of partisanship and perspective, to synthesize that input and then carry forward into Washington. All right, last one. Do you support $35 insulin for all diabetics, not just those on Medicare? Yes, let's cap the cost of insulin. There's no reason why uh, countries across the globe are paying such reduced <coughs> prices while we pay astronomical costs for that. I wouldn't even just limit it to insulin. Yes, we should and can uh, cap the cost there, but there's no reason, I mean, there is a reason, and it's the benefit we provide to the pharmaceutical industry, why we are paying an arm and a leg, and the American people are paying an arm and a leg for the high cost of prescription drugs, especially when the cost of producing those is actually so small. And the rest of the world shouldn't benefit from our ingenuity, from our investment. We need to flip the script on that, and it's gonna take making sure we remove members of Congress who are beholden to those corporate interests like Big Pharma, like Congresswoman Stefanik, who have sold out our interests in order to advance their own. So yes, I would support that. That's gonna be it, I think, for open questions, but please come up and let's chat one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. I've got about 10 or so minutes or so. But thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you. I just wanna know if you can talk with your, with your hands tied behind you. <laughs> I'm an Italian, so I'm not sure. If I did, uh, I might break an arm. <laughs> Thank you.